Welcome back, friends. Today, we traveled over to Minneapolis, Minnesota to Familia headquarters, aka just Familia Skateboard Shop now. We're actually hanging out in the skate park with the artist that inspired it all. I've uh, shouted him out on this show quite a few times, and we finally made it happen because he is in the States. Welcome to the show, Luca Buffo. Hey, thanks for having me. Dude. It's, a, it's been a while. Yes, it's been a long time. You inspired me to paint. You're the only reason I, well, I shouldn't say the only, but you are the trigger for why I started painting. Oh, that's a big thing. Honestly, to, the, the most important thing nowadays for me is to inspire people to do what they love. And yeah. if it's like inspiring you to paint, that's a blessing. Yeah, I think I found the first time I saw your stuff was in Japan a long time ago. I think I was in Shibuya or I was at one of the skateboard shops over in Tokyo. And this would have been nine years ago. And out front, they had the cover of some skateboard magazine. And it had some of your little characters like painted on it. And I remember taking a picture going, what in the world is that? And then looking you up and finding you after that. But it was seeing that, that like when I was growing up, I never really did art because I'm like, oh, I can't draw hands. I can't draw portraits or like, I always thought it was something I wasn't able to do. And then after seeing what you did, it was like, oh, I don't necessarily have to be able to paint trees. I could just kind of paint anything. And I had never seen any work like yours. And that's when it clicked with me that like, I like art when it's something that I haven't seen before. And it like evokes something, which I guess is an adult. Clearly that's what you want it to be. But you know what I mean? You have this idea of what art's supposed to look like. But I saw yours and I was like, oh shit, maybe I should do some art. And then years later, now I'm actually painting a mural for the city of Altoona on Saturday. So now it's a big part of what I do. Man, if you know how I did um, start painting, you would say that it could happen to anybody. Yeah. I started at 27. Yeah. Before that, I never really like took any like pencil to draw anything because I was into skateboarding. Right. But one day I just like decided to do a drawing for my brother for Christmas time. And then my family were, my family was hyped. It was like, oh wow, you draw? Not at all. I just wanted to do something that is not like a random T-shirt that he will just like lose the next day, you know, or just right. like put it in the closet. And then I think Facebook happened in 27, 28, put one, two drawings and then another one. And then somebody wanted to buy one. And then a brand approached me like, do you want to have a show? So it was literally like very um, random. Yeah. how everything started yeah yeah i guess for my art career it was similar and i think that was another thing that once i started looking into your work more that was another inspiration because i started painting when i was 28 and same thing it's like a am i too old to be doing this you know but after seeing your career it was like oh shit i guess i'm not too old to be doing this and i started drawing these little characters um because of seeing yours where it was like on a photo I started drawing characters on things kind of similar. Like I'd take photos and paint on them. And then it just got to a point where people would ask me for one and it'd be like, well, I don't have any more left because I've been giving them to everybody. And then all of a sudden it was like, well, how much do you want for one? Like, well, I don't know, $20, you know what I mean? And then it just kind of slowly built. And then a friend of mine who organizes a lot of the art stuff that's in, the, in my town um, was or organizing a mural project like three, four years ago. And I just kind of like chirped in her ear and I was like, Hey, I would love to paint a monster big on a wall if there's ever an opportunity. And then that's where it, and the same phone call that I got hired for that, I got hired for, um, my first art show. So I got to do both of those in the same time frame. And now, you know, I design boards and stuff for my own companies, not for others. When was the first time that you did anything with a brand? You said you got uh, approached to be in an art show. Was that like a year or two in, or I don't know the story behind that. So, when I started to paint, I had no clue what I was doing. And right. also I had no um, vision in terms of like, uh, am I going to be an artist? So that's, that's the thing. It's like when you start something, is it just random? Like you have no clue what you're doing. So you have no expectations. So if you fail, you don't care. Right. And it was my, my life kind of like, I don't know what I'm doing. And I was working back then on for this magazine named Disillusion. So I kind of like did eight years with this with this magazine. It was kind of like a crossover mag, um, skates, snow, surf, uh, culture magazine. And um, I was very well connected with the industry 
through this because I was like the sell guy. I was selling ads with oh, the magazine. Sure. So when I, I guess that when I started to draw, all those brands I used to talk with kind of like noticed it. And I, one day, Vol I think it started with electric. The, you know, the goggles remember the goggles, yeah, yeah. yeah. The friend of mine was there, um, Pacom Alois, shout out to him. And he's just like, dude, I think that's great what you're doing. Do you want to have a group, sh be part of the group show in, I think he was in Osegore and was uh, in the southwest of France. And it was my very first show with the industry. Right. Um, small boutique, a Volcom store, because Volcom back then and Electric were tied together. It was oh, okay. the same company. And I did a very crazy shit. I still remember like using the shades, but inside the box and you had to look through the box and it's like a uh, heart is not like what you see, it's becoming, it's inside you, you know, kind of. So the shades were, the, were not on the eyes, but was inside the, the heart box. Okay. It's difficult to explain. I'll was show it you. Was it three-dimensional? Yeah, kind of. Oh, cool. Yeah, Pacom gave me the chance, you know, for this first um, attempt. Yeah. And then everything started, I'd say, because then I was like, damn, I know all those companies. Maybe I should like reach out to them and be like, maybe we can do projects. And before creating like full collection with brands, it was mainly like proposing brands that I knew back then um, to be involved with my, um, let's say, tour in Europe with different artists. So I, I'm doing a hard tour right now, but yeah. like, let's say 10 years ago, I had the same idea of like bringing artists in different like skate location across Europe and they kind of like put money to support the tour. So they were, they were not like putting money on my art, but mainly on like things with a lot of people involved. And then he's, yeah, from this to where I'm now, which is like, working with <laughs> so much of different world, you know, not yeah. only the skate world. Yeah, I think eventually you have to evolve outside of just the skateboarding world. I mean, keeping that as something that's important to you, obviously, with like the documentary you did and the book and obviously while you're here, like that's still really important. But I think as we grow, we realize that there are other cool people outside of the skateboarding world too. And there's other cool opportunities that skateboarding doesn't necessarily have for you. You know what I mean? Like you're not going to paint a car for a skateboard thing. Very likely there's, you got to pursue some of those other avenues. Let's talk about this tour really quick. So heart is a book that you put out. It's like a table book about, um, local skateboard shops and their impact on, you know, skateboarding and the culture, which I got one of those books from you, uh, when that came out. You were on a tour in Europe first, and now you're on the U.S. thing. Can you tell me a little bit about it? Yeah, let's go a little bit, you know, back yeah. with this book. Um, it was in 2020, COVID time, very hard time in terms of, like, I'm a big traveler. Yeah. And me not being able to go outside, you know, my house in terms of, like, traveling is a big thing. You know, it's like you can't drink water. You die tomorrow, you know. And for me, it was kind of like dying, not being able to connect with like the world. So I was like, damn, sh stop complaining and see what's happening around you. And I was like looking to my friends who were on skate shops. They were like struggling even more because they had to pay like the brick and mortar thing. And I was like, damn, it would be um, a good idea to pay a tribute to all those skate shops around the world by... Um, celebrating 40 years of skate shops history from Japan, from Europe, from Australia, from all around the world. And I started to reach out to two, three, four different skate shops that I knew, that I know still. Everybody was so excited, so I decided to go for it. The response was insane. Like I started to also talk to the industry. It was a hard time. They were like, damn, we can't invest money anywhere. But then when they knew about the project, there is no like one skate company that didn't put one, didn't put a little something into this project. They all said yes. And yeah, um, April, 2022, it was the release of the book. And now that we can travel again, I decided to visit almost all the skate shops in the book to kind of like 
meet them for real, you know, and celebrating right. them and their community. Everything started uh, with Japan first. It was last year, um, I guess, spring, and then Europe last summer, and now I'm, I'm touring in the U.S. from east to west, celebrating almost all of them. You must have had to do Zoom interviews, or did you do phone interviews when you were reaching out to all these shops? How did you, like, how did you, because you interviewed a lot of these people, or did you have other people do interviews that were given to you? Because you kind of had to assemble a lot of things, right? It's not like you took all the photos that were in the books. They're provided by, you know, a lot of them are, like, historical, too. It's like this photo was important to this scene at this point in time or whatever. That's a lot to, you know, try to bring together. That's a very good question because... Um, actually, I've done everything by phone and email. It was very hard sometimes because the skateboarding is a world, it's a funny world where um, sometimes you gotta send a hundred of emails to get just a, an answer, you know, and you gotta, you gotta stay focused and motivated and I had to because it was hard sometimes. Um, and in terms of like the photography and the content, it was the best move. What if I could travel with a photographer who can take like all the photo of each skate shop and so then who is involved? Just you, the owner and the, the photographer with you? No, it was a good move because uh, the shop owner was like introduced me to their world. Like uh, we work with those two photographers and, and then the they, photographers introduce you to the skater so overall, the 424 pages book involved like f over 300 people. Wow. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a lot. How long did it take to make that whole book start to finish? Cause, and how many shops were in it? I don't remember. Was it like 50 or was it like 100? There's a lot. It took me a year overall, like full time. I was just so into it when i start something I, I can't do like i do many things at the same time but the book was a so insanely uh the passion behind and it's a very selfish project in a way because i'm i love so much skateboarding so sometimes my project is just, it's, it's an excuse to dive into it and be able to open the door to all those skate shops so yeah it took me took me a year and it's about 90 skate shops overall in 15 different countries. Yeah, I read the whole thing. It was really interesting because me owning a skateboard shop, like I grew up in skateboard shops and whatever. And like, I'm such a big part of, or my life is so involved in that exact type of thing too, that getting a chance to read, even just like with Familia, I'm pretty familiar with anyways with their story, but reading what was said in the book that was, you know, provided by all these different people, it's really interesting to hear that. And then hearing the ones in Japan and these other countries where the culture is totally different. Skateboarding in general is just totally different. Super interesting read for anybody that has any love for local skateboard shops, which it's hard to get skaters to read, but I would highly re recommend that book. So with um, art, you said you did the stuff with electric. You've done a lot of like capsules and I mean, you've had a long career at this point, but like you've done a lot of designs on boards, you've done shoes, you've done clothes, you've done a lot of things. What was the first uh, brand and like what was the first product that you designed? I remember vividly um, the day that I was so stoked about like creating a product because it took me back to when I was 14. Uh, I grew up in a little village named Valbonne in the southeast of France. We had a little like marble plaza where we used to skate, but it was like forbidden. So we had to run all the time or get the fine by the police, you know. It's funny when your mom has to pick you up at the police station at the age of 14 and you got to pay 30 euros just because you were skateboarding. My mom, she was yelling at them like, are you not ashamed? Where are the, you shouldn't chase those kids there's so much, you know, different, better things to do. So my mom, she was like yelling at them. And I think she said like, I will never pay for this. Do you want to keep my son in jail? Go for it. But I don't want to pay because he skates. And they ended up like leaving me, like, yeah, you can go. Sure. <laughs> I love this story. And uh, I remember <clears throat> I was sitting there on the three stairs holding um, Day One Song skateboard Deca and I was talking to my friend about it like 
oh guys, it would be it would be a dream to go in the U.S. in a, in California and maybe maybe meet that one song. And then, ten fifteen years later, you got asked to draw to make the design of that one song board on almost, and you got just uh yeah the. Um, the art director like reaching me out and do you want to do Rodney Mullen um that one song and I think it was um uh what's what was the maybe um um Tori I think Tori, Tori uh, yeah. yeah um Younes Amrani he was actually I almost cried you know I was like oh, how is it possible because I remember that day it was just like I just want to go there and skate in Venice and in California and meet them. Just like just see them skate. And now I'm involved. I'm gonna. <laughs> and six months later, I saw like they one song riding my board on a clip, you know. And Not it's sure. such a. You can give me all the money in the world. This moment I will never forget because you feel like from a little kid coming from this place where skateboarding is not even a thing it shows you that it's possible for everybody like everybody has a chance and i remember also when i had to design the board for zero jamie thomas called me like in the middle of the night so i went through instagram he was like oh give me your phone number i think i, I think i want you to design a seri oh my god you know a long time ago maybe 2015 i gave my number and he didn't pay attention i was living in france and it was 1 p.m so the phone was ringing I'm like fuck what is this and i see like an american number i was like i don't know what is this but let's go hey man it's jamie thomas you want to make a series for me i have this idea and i was like i stood up and i'm like I'm, I'm i'm designing right now it's crazy it's just like you used to see him like on on the on toy machine videos and you grew up with this and then you're in, on the phone with him and yeah I think it's just like show you that again it's possible for everybody even if you live in a, the tiniest city in Groenland or you know whatever part of the world if you have like a internet I'd say yeah sure you could make it happen yeah I think it's about being creative right because like I, I was aware very young that I wasn't going to be a pro skateboarder you know what I mean like I, when I was 14 and I had my crew of friends that I was skating with I wasn't the worst one but I was like the second to worst of the group you know what I mean and I still skated like every day and I eventually got okay but I knew that I wasn't going to be a pro skateboarder but from when I was 14 I always wanted to own a skateboard shop because I did sales and it was like, oh, well, this is a way that realistically I can get, I, I can do the things I would have wanted to do from being a pro skateboarder, but without going that avenue. You know what I mean? And even, I want to say it was within the first couple weeks of me opening my store, which was a little over 10 years ago, um, Steve Nesser, who me being a, a Midwest kid was like very aware of like, he was one of our hometown heroes pros, you know, he's pro for Birdhouse forever. And obviously owns Familia, he drove out to my shop to like come in and like congratulate me and welcome me, you know, to the community of whatever skateboarding. And to me, like that was such a meaningful moment. And then through the show, it's only like grown. And now, you know, I don't, I do work with a lot of brands as well, um, but I'm not on tour with all these pros or whatever, but I get to have my own unique role with them. You know what I mean? Or like with you in, in this example, all of a sudden I'm not just going to an autograph signing. I get to actually sit down and work with all these different people. And Jamie Thomas is rad. I've been trying to interview him for a while. He actually DM'd me back as well. He's just like responds to people. That guy's awesome. Um, so with this tour, I know that we were just talking inside the skate shop <clears throat> that you're not taking home a lot of the art with you. So can you explain like what these art shows, how they're organized, like what they look like if somebody wants to go to them? I know by the time this is over, you know, but in the future, there will be other similar ones. What's like the format of these? What I wanted to do with the, the hard tour is I wanted to do something like bigger than what the book is. It's kind of like, how can we celebrate the shop, but not only the shop, the history of the shop. Think about Familia here that's been there for almost like 20 years. 
Yeah, something yeah, like that. Like but 20. even so, like he, I mean, it's the people, you know, like Steve Nesser was a part of Phobia and everything before. Like they're so ingrained in the Minneapolis skate scene, it goes way beyond that. Yeah, you're, you're right. And I really like my goal in life is really to bring people together, even the people that I hate. Sep- separating people I hate building walls I hate I want to gather people and to me um, reaching out to Steve about like let's celebrate the shop and let's celebrate the history of the shop by inviting the old dude that you used to work with in 2005 and the new reaper that is just like the new kid on the block and bring together all those different generations this is exactly what I wanted to do so um, I just ask everyone to do something related to the shop or just a white card, do whatever you want. But I, I really can't wait to uh, yeah, see how the Minneapolis community is going to react to this. Because, yeah, obviously you're going to have like some artworks to sell. And um, I want to support as well, you know, like for this project you know some shops are very kind they're like what I want to do is like a 50-50 so you sell the piece and 50 person goes to the artist and the rest to the shop and you know we ended up like all the shops want to give all the money to the artist and this is how skate shops are for me so generous because it's not only a, it's a shelter it's a home for people but also they want to give away they want to give all the proceeds to the to the artists and it's just like props for them yeah well i think there's a little benefit there too they realize that by building community that's kind of what you have to do with a local business anyways but by having these events i don't want to say it's strategic but they're aware that like you need to do that to build the culture and worrying about the money that you'd make from this art show versus just thinking how do we continue to build the culture behind this store like you build a lot better clientele and more of a family vibe from all of that anyways and down the road those people are now more loyal to the shop and the money will come back you know if you're not paying attention to when it, it'll make its way back anyways i think over time yeah and they also know that if it's not because you're taking 50 percent of all the artists it won't change the skate shop you, go, right. you won't build a new skate park with the money so they're like hey this is not big money but we all know that a 50 bucks or a hundred dollar always help you know right so yeah steve stayed to me like hey you know what i don't want any any money through the artist everything is for them yeah yeah steve's the best so you're doing a doc you did a documentary right on this tour that you did before in uh europe and now you're doing a part two uh, what's the story behind the documentary? Where is that going to be housed? Is it just like a YouTube thing or what are like your goals with it? You know, for everything I do, I kind of like want to do the best movie in the world, you know. Sounds crazy, but when I, when I make, <clears throat> when I made the documentary Devoided in it was 20, so good. 2017, yeah. being able to interview all those people that legit and incredible I wanted to do like um, Steven Spielberg, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's even if I had no money to do it, just a simple GH6 camera, <laughs> yeah. not even like a mic here, you know, it was just like a mic on, on the camera, you know, and I was saying to the guy, like, hey, just hold on, let me put the camera on the on, on the other on side. So let's pretend yeah. I have like a lot of gear, you know, for this. And I wanted to have like million views, 10 million views. And we ended up having like 30K. It's what it is, you know, but I have like high expectations on everything I do. So with the new heart, uh, you know, chapter two. Yeah, I want, you know, for everything I do, I want to inspire people. And I know that the meaning behind heart is, is, is so important. It's the foundation of skateboarding. So if I can like, yeah, spread it all around and make sure the whole industry can see it. I mean, and I compared to the first, the chapter one, the chapter two is to me going to be way better in terms of like, um, yeah, we have the chance right now to go like visit people at their home, you know? Yeah. So it's not just like picking the brain of people at the art show. We are going to, yeah, I'm going to meet like Thomas Campbell, 
uh, in Santa Cruz and we're gonna stop by his place, you know, like, um, suppose to meet like Jim Thibault at Deluxe, oh, you know, cool. like when yeah. I'm gonna be in SF. I don't know if we're gonna make it. Jim Thibault, shout out to you. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cause, uh, you know, it, it doesn't like to be on video, I guess. But yeah, it's like I'm more intimate, yeah. more like in the privacy. And if you, you know, if you can get to, um, you know, I, I was to, I was in New York at the very first, uh, the beginning of the of the tour, and I met um, Leo Baker, but in his place. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah, that, yeah, yeah. that's gonna make the documentary more deep. You know deep diving into like people's brains so yeah. this is what I want to do you know more like raw you know and let's sure. talk I want people to be able to say things and not to try to be oh we can't talk about this because it's gonna people they're gonna be like mad at it you know right. or upset I think we have to be we have to dare to say things you know not to be rude but if something happened, let's talk about it and, and let's make sure, um, you know, I don't want to be, I don't want to do something that is just like plain, you know? Right. Everybody knows skateboarding is amazing, but if you can talk about failure and problems and issue and, you know, what's wrong with some stuff that exists in skateboarding, I think it will um, help us to improve for sure. Yeah, well, and I'm glad you found a lane that hasn't already been done. Like a lot of people, they try to find an example, you know, to base whatever their work is on and they just try to do something as good as whatever that is. But even back with Devoted, I can't think of any other documentary that's really even about that. You know what I mean? And when I watched it, I was really, I guess, surprised and impressed based on like, at that point in time, I didn't know you really did anything other than painting. So for it to actually come out like at a, a high quality, you know what I mean? It was like, oh, wow. This is impressive and really good. And I don't know why, honestly, it took me a while before I even found that documentary. Like, I had been following your career for a while, I think, before I found that. Because it was on, on Vimeo, right. I guess. Yeah, It yeah, wasn't yeah. even on YouTube. Right. <laughs> but, I mean, I don't think I saw it, like, through Thrasher's <laughs> website or anything. Or maybe, maybe I did, maybe I didn't. Either way, I found it later on. Um, but it's a good one. Everyone who has paid attention to skateboard mags or anything in skateboarding, there's not that many documentaries out there about any of the business side or any of the culture. Highly recommend, definitely go check that out. Being on this tour, you've gotten to meet like obviously a million people that you otherwise wouldn't have. Are you, do you now have just a long list of pros that you need to do board graphics for? <laughs> <laughs> I can't explain how incredible it is to do this tour in terms of like um, how beautiful it is to meet people for real. I don't know what's what's going on with me, but this is how I want to live now. My dream is to wake up in a different place every day. I don't want, yeah, I have a home. I live in Normandy. I have a wife, I have a nice house, but I really feel like I have so much to do still and along the way, you know, I got to witness New Orleans scene with Phil from, from Humidity Skate Shop. Yeah. What a scene, what a place. And then after that, you go to Austin. First, it was my first time with no comply. Yeah. Like 300 people showed up, the kids, the, the parents, the dogs. Is, and every time people were like, wanting to talk to me and uh, hug me the the energy and the power that the love that is behind I always tell people that run companies and brands like don't forget about it because yeah they, you sell your product you just like reach out by email hey this is a new collection and it's overwhelming they should go there and, and I'm not talking about the rep I'm talking about the owner sure you know hey Rick Rick and Mike from girl, they right. should be on tour. Yeah, it should be there. Meet them and co reconnect. You know, and I say them as an example because I love girl and chocolate. Right, it could be like a lot of different brands. You know, it's like don't forget about this because they do this. They do a lot of tours, but mainly it's the skate team. Right, they go there for signing, 
and the rep is there to be like, hey, we have this brand, this. No, we have to be there because the feeling that I have now, it's like, I want to build an army. Like yeah. all the skate shops now becoming my family more and more. And where we're going is in a good place. We are all going in a good place. If we stay tied together and try to try to make it better, because I feel like there's a lot of uh, problem nowadays between brands and the shop. And this is another topic, you know, I, I will cover soon, you know, probably next year. I can, it's kind of like a little tease, yeah. but I want to make sure we don't forget this and we'll always like protect and support the brick and mortar. And again, I know a lot of brands are doing good things, but they have to be there. They have to show up and meet the people. Yeah, I mean, I think if they want a brand to actually support or like a, a store to support them in return, like even just look at how in each one of these like little skate scenes, the small local brands take so much of the board wall. You know what I mean? It's because they have relationships that are built there. And for me personally, like at my store, I more frequently will order boards from a company. If the sales rep I talk to, I'm already familiar. Like, you know, if I talk with Jeff Lenoche from Baker, right? If I get a phone call from him, I'm like, hell yeah, I'm ordering some Baker boards today. Um, and it's because they're actually reaching out and building relationships with those people. And if you don't have those relationships, then all of a sudden it's just like retail space. And that's it. And then you lose all of the value of what that place was in the first place. But actually having that community is everything. And I think, um, you know, like Rick and Mike as an example, when you come up and you build this brand, it's because you have relationships with all these people. You have all these fans in skateboarding, you know, people want to follow you and they want to support you. But as you slowly fade more into the background, if you're not actively, you know, engaging in that kind of way, you're going to kind of fade from relevancy to a certain degree, I think. Um, if you look at somebody like uh, Andrew Reynolds, he's been very active with all that stuff. He's still skating all the time, still has a part in all the different videos. Like, I think that makes a huge difference with everybody connecting with the brand, which then turns into dollars anyways down the road. Yeah, and <clears throat> I think like recently I've seen like Eric Ellington on like Death Wish going to Santa Fe, yeah. and he was also with Sammy Baca was there and a, a bunch of people. That's the most ama amazing thing. Yeah. It was there with the local and all the kids were there. And I think they kind of like release the um, Death Wish, the Baker as a Death Wish uh, number two, you know, yeah. and it, everybody's seen it. But it, it doesn't matter if like, all the kids and local showed up. And I think they understand the meaning of to be there and signing boards, not just like sending the video and they have a video premiere because that's what they do now they just send the file right yeah <laughs> and they invite the crowd to uh to meet them and see the video but i think it's not enough yeah you should be there yeah. like like i do like why why am i am i even here like i should just pay somebody because i have an idea and just do the tour for me yeah because what i learned through this tour is just like i am building this community I am building my community and now they trust me. And if tomorrow I want to do something with those shops, I talk about 90, even more around the world, I just have to do a little kick yeah. and I'm connected with them and we can do big things, you know, and I'm down to make it bigger and like involve with brands, you know, and be like brands, skater, like all the skate industry together and let, let's sit down around a table, like a round table and just, talk and stop talking about just like what's the next the next product but how can we make it better yeah dude well i know that you have some other things to do thank you so much for coming on the show this was an awesome conversation thank you for inspiring me to do artwork um and i'm excited to take home one of those paintings from you bro peter smolik yeah dude 1999 recover i think it was a transfer magazine i don't remember which cover but shout out to peter smolik I met him for Devoided, and I grew up with his video, uh, Shorty's Fulfill the Dream. And yeah, it's a big inspiration style-wise, the best back then. I mean, I think his style's still sick. Still sick, <laughs> Honestly, I know. Yeah, yeah. But I wish I can see more of him right, nowadays, yeah, you know? Yeah. It's just like, you know, that time. For sure. I don't know. It's still like, shout out to you, Peter Smolik. Love you. <laughs> All right, so where can people follow you? On Instagram, it's uh, Lucas underscore Beaufort, uh, right? That, that's what it is? That exact. Cool. It's exact. And uh, I'd say 
I have a bunch of stuff for, <laughs> through inter internet, so they just type yeah. my name sure. on Google and they can see like a few interviews and like, yeah, I'd say Instagram is the best way to connect, you know, I tried all different things, you know, but TikTok, fuck that shit. And um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm more about like, yeah, yeah. Let's, 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 let's remember that we, it's very important to stay who you are. And I feel like all those social net networks, app, they kind of like dictate what you have to do. Oh, the trend right now is to dance. Oh, okay, so I have to dance while painting. I have to sing while I skate. And this is very toxic, I guess. Like, this is bullshit. And back then it was just like, do you. So what I'd say to the youth, keep doing what you love to do. And if like, they tend to tell you why you have to do, like, fuck that. If you want to keep just posting photo and you don't like to do reels and video stuff, keep doing what you want to do. And I'm sure all those apps, they would be like, they know, and we have to, we have to listen. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you have to take your own way. Just following everybody else, you're never going to be happy anyways. And there's always opportunities. And anything that you want to do, I, I love about talking about skateboarding in this kind of way. And I always encourage this with, like, skaters in my shop and stuff, too. If you just, you just have to get creative and go, what's the actual, like, base thing that I want out of this? Is it to be skateboarding? Cool. Well, you can still skateboard your whole life anyways. You know what I mean? Or whatever the industry is. If you can like open up your mind to the other opportunities that are out there, there are so many different paths to get to the place that you want to get to. And don't only exclusively look at what other people have done. Times are always changing. There's always new opportunities. So don't, don't limit yourself just because you haven't seen somebody else do this thing because it's still possible to do this thing. Yeah, and, and again, I want to jump on this, that I met Tim Kerr, is a, a legendary artist from, um, uh, from Austin, and I, I, it was written on a piece of paper on a, or on a board, it was uh, the best skateboarder, the best skater is the one having the, more, the most fun, you know? And it's the same thing for everything, for art, like the best artist is the one that fucking love to create not to yeah. be the best like successful you know uh, why you know uh, you know what i'm talking about yeah, it's yeah. just like let's have fun on yeah. anything we do you know and that's that's the key i guess is just like let's take it not too seriously and yeah let's embrace this thank you for joining us for this episode of the passion pod we hope you enjoyed it as much as we did we'll see you soon